All right. Uh, uh, let me know when you want me to start. All right. Uh, let's see here. I think this is about everybody. So, welcome to Hurt Me Plenty. This uh, talk is about the design and development of Arganium. Uh, if you, if this does not sound familiar, you might be in the wrong place. Uh, so, before we get into what is Arganium, uh, first, who am I? Uh, my name is Todd Carr. I'm a DevOps engineer at Unity Technologies. Uh, I'm a security enthusiast, but probably most importantly, I am an enormous fan of classic shooters. Uh, if you're interested, all my contact info is there. But you don't want to hear about me. You want to hear about Arganium and what is it and all that. So Arganium is a cooperative hacking shooter. It's a cooperative experience designed for merging ha uh, Jeopardy-style CTF and classic shooter. Uh, in this case, it's specifically built on top of Doom 2. Uh, both of these, te uh, your team is going to be divided. They'll have to work together. They're going to try and get to the end. They're going to be graded on points based on time of completion, number of kills, and of course, difficulty of hack challenges, attempted, things like that. So anyway, when I made this, that's all nice, but I had, I'm kind of an idealistic person, so I had some ideals in mind that I thought were really important. And they were basically that anybody should be able to make challenges, anybody should be able to make levels, and most importantly, anybody should be able to play this game with anyone they want, whenever they want, wherever they want, period. Anybody should be able to do that. It's a GPL3 project, so you know, anybody can clone it. Uh, you probably can't play it at work, though. That may not work out too well. So why would anybody want that? Uh, this is a big deal for me, but basically games for me are hugely important. They're massively important. They're as important as movies and books and music. It's like telling somebody that they can't play a game because it's not available or something like that is like an insult to me. And I think, most importantly, the games are a huge, huge part of our culture. They're like everywhere. They're, even if you're not a gamer, games affect your life. I mean, we just had like last year, like a multi-million dollar movie come out about one of the most successful games of all time. Games are a part of our life. But I also believe as a hacker that hacks are a huge part of our lives. They pervade everything. They literally let, uh, let us shape part of the world that we live in. I mean, like WannaCry just came out, right? And it definitely shaped a lot of people's lives. And that's why I think most people in this room can probably agree. I also really believe in trying to bridge communities and trying to push into that gray area uh, somewhere between two communities. That's all cool, but we don't necessarily have a lot of things in common between those two, right? But I disagree. See, in many ways, hacks and hacking is like a puzzle, right? It's just, I think it's something we could probably all agree on, right? It's, it's a unique problem that we take a look at and we say, how the hell can I solve this thing? You know, what can I do about that? And many times, you're even cooperative about it. Very rarely do you just completely work on your own. You use either research materials, you talk with your colleagues, uh, maybe you try to one-up your friends, whatever it happens to be. That's a big cooperative puzzle solving experience. And that's very, very cool. That's just like, uh, it's just like a game. On the other side, I also think that games and the gaming community actually have a lot in common with us. Both of these communities, if you're a member of it, is very difficult to explain to other people. Like if you're a hacker, how much fun is it to try and explain to a non-hacker what you do? It's like, hey, it's no fun, right? Uh, if you're a gamer, trying to explain to someone like say, Oh man, I pushed the buttons in an order and it totally did this thing on the screen. It's like that if you're not a gamer, that does not make sense. And on top of that, gamers, generally speaking, like many kinds of game, maybe not all kinds, but most are usually kind of open to at least more than a few, they also love puzzle games. They love puzzles. Like uh, uh, some titles that came out last year, the, some really awesome shooters involved combat puzzles. There's also the classic ones like Tetris and so forth. It's like puzzles are pretty cool. I think there's actually a lot of inroads between those. And this game is a way that you can combine these two different elements. You can give a puzzle game that both we and they can both enjoy. So, why would anybody want that in security? Uh, biggest thing is that CTFs are heinously complicated to run. Uh, quick show of hands, yay, audience participation. How many people in here have run a CTF in the past six months? Anyone? Nobody? Okay, this is even better than I thought. Uh, most of the time there's somebody. So, in my opinion, it's a bad thing that we don't run CTS more often. It should be easy. It's like, I, I personally feel better if you can have one every week. Because if you want to be good, if you want to do either red team or blue team, and if you want to uh, do bug bounties or any of those things, normally you need a team. You need to know how to work with your team. 
And the only way that you can actually figure out how to work with a team is to actually do things with a team. You need practice, you know, just like any skill, right? This is a way that you can very easily, very quickly just fire up a CTF. You can burn through this in like say somewhere between like 15 and 30 minutes. It's usually about the average gameplay length. It's like this is something that you can run every week if you wanted to. It's easy to run. We should have more of those. This is also a really good way in order to reach out to people who aren't necessarily 100% in your sphere. Like say your boss may not be a hacker. But that's okay. They probably have management skills and you do need to deal with them. This is a way that you can still actually have some way to be able to play something with them and build that team. So that's cool. But something I actually feel much more passionately about is that we are in dire need at all times of new blood and new ideas. All the time. You know, this, I, I mean, the industry moves pretty quickly. We always need to move even faster if we want to stay ahead of whatever attacks are out there. We need new techniques, new everything. And we usually need a lot of new ideas. This is one of those ways that we reach out to those people because I'm firmly of the belief that there are tons of people walking around that are not in security that have excellent ideas that we need. You know, gamers are some of those people. They have interesting ways of looking at problems. We also have interesting ways of looking at games, but we need more of those bridges built in our community. We need new blood and we need ways to reach out to people. This is just another way that you can reach out. So uh, on top of all of that, the educational benefits of gaming are impossibly awesome because games are king when it comes to engagement. When you're trying to discuss something really complicated, it can be really, really especially like say, if you're trying to explain like say how a SQL exploit works, this is, really complicated stuff for a lot of people, you need something that engages. You need something that hooks people in and makes them want to stay there. And there is literally nothing better than games when it comes to engagement. Nothing is better than that. There are some awesome links here. I strongly recommend all of them. They will all do a much better job of explaining why gamifying education is amazing. But if you're just going to watch one, you should really check out the first one because Extra Credits is incredible. Like, I cannot even begin to describe. They, they definitely know their stuff. It's very entertaining to watch. So anyway. Okay, so now we know all about why this thing exists. Let's talk about how it plays, right? Okay. So, I promise this graphic is not that scary. Uh, we're basically going to go from one side to the other uh, in terms of game state. You're going to start out your game. Your team, typically between two and eight players, is going to be broken into two parts. You're going to have your control team, who are your hackers, and you're going to have your marines, which are your game players. Both of them are going to have two distinct duties, most, uh, most notably, the game players are going to plug in to a Xandernum server, and they're going to play uh, a game built on Doom 2, and their whole job is get to the end of the level. That's all they gotta do. Uh, they also only have one life, so they gotta be careful, but that's all they gotta do. On the control side, all your hackers are just gonna have to plug into the scoreboard. It's just a web server, it's very simple stuff. Uh, they plug in, and they need to solve challenges. They have some buttons they can push, so on and so forth. But when the game starts, the two kinds of challenges, core challenges and edge challenges, are locked. The hackers can't do much. But they do have some other buttons for raising and lowering what we call hack lifts. Hack lifts are special sectors and zones in the game that can be raised or lowered when you click a button, which is pretty cool. On the other side, area one is open to the control play uh, is open to the marine players, but there is a hack switch in every area. It looks like a switch, but when they hit it, it sends a code back over to the web server, which unlocks challenges. They need to find it. There's also one and only one secret area in each area. We'll get to that in a minute. So, Marines are moving around, they kill some demons, so on and so forth, and they find the hack switch. When they hit the hack switch, two things happen. The first is that it sends a code back over to the server, unlocks all the core challenges, these are worth points, the hackers can get to work. While they're working, an infinite monster spawn is also started in that zone, so the Marines have to try and survive against this. It's not a lot, but it's enough that the hackers don't want to take too long. Generally speaking, about five, ten minutes per hack. These are not super complicated things, or generally speaking, what you're aiming for. Though, of course, you can make whatever you like. So, that's great. When the hackers actually solve a challenge, they find the flag. They enter the flag, it sends a code back down to the game server that does two things. It opens the hack door, these giant doors that actually wall off zones that can't be shot, used, or otherwise interacted with normally. This code opens that, raises the door, and kills the infinite monster spawns so the Marines can move into the next area. And so play loop continues. Uh, we get down to the end. Thing is, is that at any point, there are secret areas, right? If the Marines step into a secret area, it sends a code back over to the web server that unlocks edge challenges. Edge challenges are not worth any points, but if the control team decides to complete one of those, 
then they can spawn a power up directly into the game. So they can pick things like uh, weapons, armor, health, things like that. The idea is that you talk to your marine players and say, what are you low on, so on and so forth. They push a button, they get power ups. So that's great, that's our basic gameplay loop. So what's it built with? Uh, a lot of these are gonna be familiar. Uh, the only one that's probably not too familiar is Xanderdom. If that sounds like Greek to you, that's okay. Uh, Xanderdom is a very popular, very awesome source port of Doom 2. Uh, there's a really good reason why that one's being used over others that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but basically, a lot of these were picked because I'm a systems guy, I'm not a web dev, and I needed tools that I was familiar with. So I picked Ruby uh, and Rails 5. Rails 5 has a very specific use. The web sockets are needed because this game has real-time communication. It's really, really important. Polling is not going to be enough because uh, seconds could mean someone uh, getting killed in the game and actually succeeding. Uh, this game was also built with a tremendous volume of coffee. Like, so much coffee like I cannot describe. Uh, I actually killed, during the year plus that it took me to make the first version, uh, a $800 coffee maker. So if you're wondering how much coffee, about you know that, that much coffee. Uh, it was also built with the undying appreciation and love of my wife for not murdering me during this thing. Thank you very much, honey. So, moving along, how's it work? Okay, so we're gonna describe this in reverse order because it's easier to list it that way, but it's easier to describe it the other way. So there will be a graphic after this, I promise. The clients have very, very small requirements. Uh, the marine clients, all they need is copy Xanderdom, which is open source, you can just clone it, it's gotta be, a dot three, it's gotta be 3.0 or higher, uh, and they're fully legitimate and purchase game one. Uh, that should totally be in your possession as one of the greatest games of all time. Uh, it's also like $5 on Steam. You should totally go out and buy it. And if you can't, you should talk to me and I can, give, and I can see if I can just buy one for you. So the, uh, the, uh, the hackers on the other side, the control team, all they need is a web browser and anything else you would normally bring to a CTF. That's really about it. So for the game, uh, for the game server, the Xanarnum server is actually wrapped up by this program called Certain. And Certain is basically going to hook the server console for the input and output, and it's going to act as a command interpreter. So only certain commands will actually be forwarded to the game server, and only certain outputs will actually be allowed from the game server. This is all in turn wrapped up by Gloom, which is the Rails 5 app. This acts as the scoreboard, it's the challenge server, so on and so forth, and it's the ultimate source of truth for the game state. It actually wraps up certain, it calls certain, and it hooks that input and output as a separate thread. So that's basically kind of sort of how this thing works. The promise graphic, uh, you can actually see very clearly how, say, Certain and Gloom are going to interact together, but each side of the team is only going to need to interact with one actual portion of this program. So, okay. so why Gloom? Because I'm sure somebody asked, why Rails? Why? The uh, thing is, is that I'm doing something really ugly. Uh, there are some horrible, horrible pieces of code in here, and Rails and Ruby let you do really horrible things. Uh, it also, I am the primary dev on the project. Uh, I needed to use what I was familiar with, and it was flexible enough to be able to allow you to do really, really bizarre things. Rails in particular was a really good choice here because uh, most notably Rails 5 has uh, action cable, which is great for built-in handling of web sockets, and surprisingly, uh, especially given Rails beginnings, it actually works really, really well. The biggest thing is that it needed to be simple to build and understand. And while there's definitely some hysteric arguments about uh, the understandability of Rails, it has a huge community, there's tons of documentation on it. If you want to understand how Gloom works, it, it, it's very simple. It's just like Rails, it looks like any other Rails app, it just has one or two weird things happening in it. But it needed, it needed this flexibility, it needed to be easy to understand, and it lets you do really terrible things. So, uh, that's great stuff. Why certain? And certain is written in Ruby, it's just straight up Ruby. And again, this was actually to solve kind of another interesting problem, which is that the core game's uh, old networking is absolutely archaic. It's like there is no other way to describe it. I mean, it was good for 1994, I guess. But, you know, it's all peer-to-peer. -peer. Having trusted clients in a game centered around hackers is like an awful idea. Uh, among other things, even if you, so I use Xanardom. Xanardom actually breaks that apart into client-server architecture, which is pretty cool. Uh, the big thing is that how do you interact with the server? Well, Xanderdom has this cool thing called Archon, except Archon is also over 20 years old, and at best it's protected by a eight character password with no special characters. Again, this is a game aimed for hackers. That's probably not a brilliant idea because you're basically praying that in over two decades there's never been a breach on Archon. Uh, and I didn't want people to focus on that. I wanted people to focus on the game instead. So 
this whole thing came back to, great, I need to enter commands and receive commands from the Interactive Server Console. How do you do that? And using Ruby again to actually hook those inputs was definitely the way to go. Uh, it should be noted that this whole thing about flexibility is that if you don't like any of these components, that's great. You, this is a GPL v3 project. You can just clone this thing and replace whatever you want. I tried to pick stuff that was as easy to understand and uh, replaceable and flexible as possible because I want you having a good time if you think this is terrible. If you think like Ruby is like the most awful thing ever, then you are totally free to just make your own replacement for certain in Python or Go or whatever. And Gloom is not going to care. Gloom is just going to call whatever it is that you tell it to call. That's it. If you think Rails is the devil, that's fine. You can totally replace that with, I don't know, an Apache server backed by Tomcat doing something in Java. It's like what, whatever you want, that's fine. That's part of the idea. This is not just my project. This project can be yours too. Just pretty cool. So what does work, right? That's, that's all wonderful. Lots of stuff works. Uh, the, <laughs> so uh, I promise I won't spend too much time on this because uh, everybody always likes to hear about the other stuff. But the game server works, works fine. The web server works fine. There's even a cool little setup script in the base of the Gloom directory that you just run setup and it hooks with a uh, with Whiptail to give you an ncurses dialog based uh, way of generating configuration files. It'll even dynamically pull out into the challenges and levels directories to be able to actually build this stuff for you. To be able to play this, you just clone it down with your installation and you tell it to connect to the game server. There's even a startup script for the clients in there, which is pretty cool. Uh, it even supports multiple options and all that stuff. The Gloom interface actually works. You can click on buttons and things change color. And if you click on the raise and lower hack lifts, it sends codes back down to the game server and all. Kills work, even finish scripts, which are really cool. So you can splice this thing into other CTFs. It's a script you can specify, just arbitrary thing in the system that says, oh, hey, on completion of the game, take all the stats from the game and feed it to something else. So if you wanted this to spawn up, like say, an SSH server that's highly vulnerable as part of some sort of uh, scenario CTF, you can do that with this. People have to play through Organium, and once they're done, it'll spin up a server. You know, there, there's lots and lots and lots of stuff here. Even challenges are super simple to build. Uh, levels, I mean, this is, this is an over two-year-old, uh, 20-year-old game. It's not particularly difficult to build levels for. <laughs> So that's all fun, but what could use a little more time in the oven? Uh, the web interface, I am a systems guy. I'm not a web dev. Uh, it's pretty obvious that there are some parts of this that really need some CSS love. Sorry about your eyes uh, bleeding. Uh, I also thought it would be pretty cool to have a web form as an alternative to the setup script because while the setup script is simple to me, I built it. So, you know, of course it's easy to me. Uh, I thought it would be nice as an alternative, but I don't know how to do that right now. Uh, some more reliability interfaces because web sockets are also kind of finicky. Once in a while they drop, uh, yay, new tech. Uh, I also kind of wish the power-up system communicated a little better to the player. Like once you know what's happening, it's perfectly fine, but I kind of wish that I had the buttons change color uh, in a different fashion, make it a little more uh, obvious. And as always, uh, I could always use more stock challenges. You are encouraged for a real game to actually build your own because it's easy to do and it's super easy to port existing CTF challenges. It's, it's literally like a YAML file. You put in the flag and you just put some link to the server in the, in the content dirt and it's done. It's an Organium challenge. So this is not like a build from scratch thing. And more levels would be great uh, because honestly, I'm not a level dev. I, I've got one great level, a good dev level, and you can see my first attempt. Uh, in fact, uh, submissions are always welcome. I am always checking out pull requests and so forth if you have something great. In fact, I actually would not be upset if you just like went out to the project site like right now and you like cloned it down and you started building something because you know like I, I, I love this stuff and I have done it for over a year now. Just saying, you could, you could go there right now. So anyway, moving right along. What didn't work, right? What, what was horrible, horrible failure? Uh, there are so many things that did not work in this project. Like, uh, there, I mean, this whole thing could probably be described as a gigantic roller coaster of failure straight into the ground. It's like, I, I, tons and tons, everything fought me on this project. Like, I tried to use uh, some more classic feeling ports, and turns out they all maintain peer to peer networking. So that was not going to work. Uh, Xanderdom 2, uh, 2, which is the stable, and it's the first one everybody finds when they go to the Xanderdom page. Turns out that doesn't actually support some of the advanced scripting needs that I need within the game, so that's not going to function at all. Uh, the core game's ACS script, uh, stands for uh, Action Control Script, that thing fought me because it turns out that, oh, you want secrets? 
Well, secrets aren't client-side only. They're not calculated on the server. So how do you tell the server that the players just found a secret? It's like, well, I had to come up with a really weird, janky way that I could check for that automatically. The, uh, I, I also, I love my favorite question that I get out of everybody on every part of this project was, yeah, but why would anybody want that? And it's like, just, I know this is a really complicated topic. Just trust me. I need this weird ass thing you've never thought of. <laughs> Rails 4 was a horrible failure, like in every possible way. Uh, take that however you want. But basically, uh, WebSockets did not work. Uh, I could go on for hours about this, but, but the whole thing is that eventually this worked. And it started working really well. And that's kind of what we're about, right? You find a problem, you find a puzzle, and you bash your head on it seemingly without any effect until magically one of the bricks moves and you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. I, wow, I'm making progress. That's basically what this project was a lot of for me, was a whole lot of beating your head on a wall until something moved. So what's in the future for the project? Uh, there's a number of really, really good ideas. I'm always taking ideas uh, and, of course, pull requests. But uh, I would really like to put GitFS on the repo. I haven't done that because, frankly, if you use GitFS, it's not part of normal Git. So if you don't have that, then when you try and clone the project, it doesn't work. That's kind of like a big FU to me. So I figure we won't do that. Plus, the levels that are in the repo with the binary files, uh, those are like a meg. So it's not really a big deal. Uh, some automated build tests would be nice if I can find a way to automatically test interactive uh, stuff. Uh, some good tutorials would be good. There is a full featured wiki on it already that describes everything from a dev environment, how to build things, philosophy at work, all that stuff. Uh, if you find something that is not clear, please let me know. I will go back and document the heck out of it. Uh, it'd also be really nice to have some more helper scripts. I also had kind of an idea for some building block levels, some little pieces that you could just copy and paste in order to build something. And it'd be really nice to have some more uh, robust challenge handling so you could do some really weird things. But at the moment, what's there is simple and functions. So, yeah. uh, I also had kind of a far future idea for there's no reason with uh, the server architecture that you can't support concurrent teams all running against the same server that you could actually send notices back and forth to each one. You know, there's, there's lots and lots and lots of cool stuff that you can do with this. And uh, that's basically the primary. Uh, I didn't have enough time to be able to do a full demo here, but I do actually have a game server uh, with me. If you want to try it out or you want to see what it's all on about, just kind of be any time during the con, and I'll be more than happy in order to fire this stuff up and talk your ear off about it. Uh, otherwise, I got uh, whatever rainy time we got for questions. Uh, that's all I got. So, any questions? Nobody? Uh, don't be shy. I will talk about this thing for hours and hours, and as my wife can attest, probably for years. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I got. Thank you.